continuing our series, Hymnstory, in which we are looking at the history of some of the well, most well-known uh, hymns and songs of our Christian tradition. These hymns uh, transcend contemporary and traditional worship. Even the most rocking contemporary worship service often includes versions of these old hymns. In fact, this morning in our 9 o'clock service, we heard Amazing Grace to the tune of the House of the Rising Sun at the first service. Uh, some people were a little... Uh, couldn't quite get their heads around that, uh, but it, it worked very well. And oftentimes, at least snippets of these verses will find their way into even uh, the most uh, adventurous uh, contemporary songs. And traditional worshipers uh, like you and I have found these hymns to be a part of our tradition for our entire lives. This morning, we are looking at one of the most recognizable songs, not just hymns, but songs in the English-speaking world, Amazing Grace. Uh, musical statisticians, and believe it or not, there really is such a thing as a musical statisticians, but they say that this hymn is performed somewhere around 10 million times a year. That's just how often it's performed, not how many times you listen to it on the radio or in a recording. It's a hymn that we often play at funerals as a, a sign of uh, our deep mourning, but also our trust in God. It's often uh, used, it became popular in the American Second Great Awakening, that great revival of American Protestant faith in the 1800s. Baptists and Methodists really took a hold of amazing grace during that time after it kind of languished in obscurity for about 50 years in England. It was a central hymn used in the abolition of slavery and then in the civil rights movement. It speaks to the heart of those that go through times of hardship and trial and isn't that really every one of us at some point? And it makes a tremendous amount of sense when you consider the life of the author of these words, John Newton. In the mid-1700s, John Newton was an Anglican priest. The Anglican faith is what birthed both the Episcopalian and the United Methodist Church. He wrote this hymn as an illustration for a Sunday morning of worship on New Year's Day. But most historians look at this hymn as his spiritual autobiography in verse. Now, John Newton, like many pastors, yours included, wasn't always a pastor. In fact, some of us used to really not be pastors, like a lot. Um, if you talk to my friends from high school or college, or perhaps my parents, I would encourage you not to, uh, and told them that John Mulaney had become a pastor, their response would not be, oh, that makes sense. It probably would have been more like incredulous laughter. Are you sure? Uh, an example, uh, as I was figuring out my call to ministry in college, a friend's mother said to her, John knows he's going to have to go to church if he becomes a pastor, right? <laughs> Sometimes we take a long and winding road to get to where we are supposed to be. The same is true for, for John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. John grew up without religion. Uh, he not only was an atheist, but he was antagonistic toward religion. He loved to tell people that he believed that God was a myth, that God was a fairy tale. He liked to get in fights, both physical and philosophical, with faithful people. In his teens, he was conscripted into the Royal Navy, and just as quickly, he deserted from the Royal Navy to meet up with a girl named Polly Catlett. He was head over heels in love with this young woman, but he knew that his life was not the kind of life that his, her father would approve of. And the problem was, he wanted to marry Polly, but John wasn't quite ready to change, as many young men can be. So John found work on a ship, not just any ship, but this was uh, the 1700s, so it was a slave ship. He joins the crew of the slave ship, the Greyhound. Now, on the ship, he was famous for being the worst of the worst when it came to both his behavior and his language. Keep in mind, this is a slave ship full of sailors, a group about whom the phrase, cursed like a sailor, was made. John's the worst. He writes obscene poems, body songs. He uses the worst and most offensive language, and according to one crewmate, if he didn't have the word, he made a new one up. The crew loved him. The captain hated him. This rough-and-tumble life and often antagonistic behavior that he was known for got him in all kinds of trouble. At different points in his time 
serving on the Greyhound. He was chained up with the slaves below deck, starved almost to death, and forced into indentured servitude in Sierra Leone for 18 months. He was a bad, bad guy. But along the way, he was a good sailor, a brave sailor. Off the coast of Ireland, the ship ran into a violent storm. Men were getting washed off the deck, and John and another crewmate tied themselves to the ship's pump to steer the ship through the storm. And in the midst of all the wind and the rain, the captain's words reverberated through his heart and his mind, God have mercy on us. God have mercy on us. These were the words that echoed through his heart and his mind as the seas eventually calmed and they resumed their journey. Now as I read all about John Newton in preparation for this sermon, I think I discovered something theologically important that we have forgotten in the modern world. And that is, boats make great Christians. Boats make, now hear me out. We do not have a lot of opportunities in the modern world to almost die on a boat. But apparently, if you have that experience, you are almost guaranteed to have some kind of conversion experience. If we still cross dangerous and violent seas on big wooden ships, I think the conversion rate would be a little bit higher. All you have to do is look at our scriptural tradition to see this is true. It bears out. I've got evidence. Jonah. You remember Jonah from the Old Testament. Gets thrown overboard during a violent storm. Gets swallowed by a big fish. Does what God asked him to do. Life-changing moment. Paul. Paul loved to talk about all the things that he endured, all the things that he had to do as Christian, including multiple shipwrecks. The disciples, you remember them on the Sea of Galilee, a violent storm blows up, Jesus is sleeping in the boat, they're terrified, Jesus calms the storm, transforming moment. John West, his faith was tested during a storm at sea, and he saw a group of Moravians as he was traveling with, singing throughout the storm, unafraid, and he wanted what they had. John Newton, this week, next week we're going to talk about Horatio Spafford and his Well With My Soul, another storm-ravaged story. All I'm saying is if you're looking for an experience of God, buy a boat. <laughs> you have to cross the Atlantic in it, though. That's, that's part, of the, part of the deal, sorry. Uh, but I'd love to tell you that John Newton and this experience in the storm was a transforming moment all of a sudden, and everything afterwards was completely different, but that's just not the case. He comes away from the experience pondering and wondering about this idea of God's grace. He identifies it as a conversion experience, and yet not much changes in his life. He spends another seven years on the sea, on a slave ship. It's another nine years after he gives up the sea before he actually becomes an Anglican priest, and another two years before he writes Amazing Grace. Eighteen years, eighteen years it takes him from slave ship to Amazing Grace. You know, not everyone gets this one-and-done conversion experience. Oftentimes it seems that God sparks an idea in our heart and our mind, and it takes some time, some experience, for God to wear off some of those rough edges, for us to finally get to a place where we start to look a little bit more like what we're called to be. Not everyone gets the Paul experience, where he gets knocked off the horse and blinded, and all of a sudden he becomes the great apostle. No, a lot of times it takes a little bit more time. John Wesley took years before he felt assured of his faith and salvation. It certainly took John Newton some time, and I'll tell you, it took John Mulaney a little bit of time, too. I find this very interesting in a time in Christendom when it seems like we don't want to give God much time to do work in the hearts and minds of people. A friend of mine once said that we expect people to get Jesus and get right in one fell swoop. We have this expectation of miraculous change, a 180-degree turn from who we were to who we're called to be, and heaven forbid you ever make a mistake or sin again or fall back from where you want to be. 
modern Christians, we, we talked about this briefly last week, love to quote that passage from Jesus and the story of the woman caught in adultery. You remember that story where the crowd brings this woman before Jesus and they're prepared to stone her. And Jesus says, he without sin cast the first stone and everybody drops their rocks and walks away. And Jesus says, well, if no one condemns you, then I don't condemn you either. And then that line that we like to quote so much, go and sin no more, it's a great line. But do you really think that woman got it all together right then and there as she went and sinned no more? She had an incredible and transforming and powerful moment with Jesus Christ, but she had a lifetime of experience and choices that came before she encountered Jesus. I think maybe it took her a little while and some more bad decisions before she changed her ways. See, that's not how it often goes in faith. As we talk about sin and forgiveness, I can tell you in 15 years of doing this, it, it's a struggle. It's a hardship. It's a fight against our bent towards sinning. Even the Apostle Paul, who lifts himself up as an example to follow in the early church, said in Romans, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Which is very confusing and hard to read, but the point is, sometimes you find yourself making the wrong decision even when you don't want to. When we sing this hymn, I think we often put those dangers and toils and snares and our own wretchedness in the past tense. As in, whoo, I'm glad that's over. That's what I went through. That's what I was. Smooth sailing from here on out. Thank you, God. But the longer I follow Christ, the more aware I am that I am still pretty capable of my own wretchedness. But I'm trying. As the hymn says, I was blind, but now I see. Now I can see where I couldn't see before. Now I know what's happening. I can see that, yes, I have come through dangers and toils and snares. And it turns out I'm going to do uh, a couple more of those if I'm going to follow this radical Savior I love so much. The difference is this time I'm going to go where God is calling me to go. I'm going to go into it with my eyes wide open and aware and looking for where God is in the midst of this. Sometimes I am actually going to willingly walk into that danger. Sometimes I'm going to willingly go to places I have no business being because God asked me to. This passage we read from Ephesians talks about God's grace, how God saves us. Not from our own doing, not that we deserve it, not that we do it through our own good works, but by grace alone does God save us. And the good works we do now, in the next verse that we didn't read, he says, are to become our way of life. As a result of God's grace, we change our way of life. This good we do is meant to be our way of life. What great words, what challenging words put before us because if we're going to model our lives on Christ that means that sometimes we're going to willingly go into a risky place we're going to be disciples if we're going to make more disciples if we're going to change the world in the name of Jesus Christ it means that we're going to go forth in his name to reach the lost and the weary and the lonely that comes with a certain degree of risk and that's harder now. We live in a risk-averse culture. That's why we fly in planes rather than take big boats across the sea. It's safer and faster and more convenient. But I worry that we're getting complacent in the relative safety of our world and the country we live in. There was a recent study my district superintendent showed a group of clergy that he was meeting with that showed that the longer you are a Christian the less Christian you act. All the markers that we judge a Christ follower's life by, those actions that, that we say this defines who a Christian is, things like spiritual disciplines and prayer and worship and reading and reading scripture and serving others, they decline. From the moment 
of salvation to the end of our life. There is a precipitous decline that happens. And somehow the church, what we are calling you to do, who we are calling you to be, who God is calling you to be, we are failing in that mission. Because we become satisfied with our lives. We've lost that sense of holy dissatisfaction, of wonder, of desire to grow and be more than we are now. We become satisfied with our faith as it is, with a comfortable existence. And as I thought about this, I wondered to myself if maybe all of our focus on spiritual gifts and strengths for ministry doesn't push us to only do that which we're comfortable with. Those parts of our lives that we like, those things that we can easily adapt to our lives instead of giving the fullness of our life over to Christ. We decide to sit back and wait. You know, we forget sometimes that God is a comforter, but we're not called to be comfortable. There's an element of this that we put everything behind us. And we forget that God has more for us ahead of us. That God has a higher expectation of who we're going to be. That we're going to make this our way of life. The goodness that God imbues in us. The, the ability to do these great things as we respond to God's love and God's grace. That's challenging. In fact, that should be a little bit scary, a little bit terrifying for us, that, that God would trust us this much and say, you, I'm going to use you and you and you and you and this guy up here in the black dress, we're going to use them all. We're going to use them all. We're going to put them out there and I'm going to say, I'm going to work through you. And that's not to a comfortable place. That's to a place of action. A place of risk. A place of stepping out on faith and saying, God, I'm not sure if I can do this. And turns out I probably can't do this without you, so I'm going to ask you to go with me, God. Where are you in this walk of faith? Have you been coasting toward heaven since your moment of salvation? Or are you looking for the next danger and toil and snare that God's going to put out in front of you? That God's going to see you through, grow you through, change lives around you through? Life is not easy. It's hard. It's a struggle. Don't give up. Go where he leads.